Christmas service, the Holocaust lecture series, who show up the week before spring break to be rewarded. This is one of the most fundamentally important lectures of the whole series. We're very happy to offer this series and offer this lecture. Dr. Goodman was awarded her doctorate from UC Davis in sociology, where her work focused on the Danish resistance and on Danish rescue of Jews during World War II. Prior to her retirement in 2013, Dr. Goodman was our academic coordinator for 12 years and did a commendable job of securing and building the formidable reputation of this lecture series. She continues to serve as the director for the Center of the Study of the Holocaust and Genocide here at Sonoma State. She has heard many, many accounts over the past 12 years from scholars and from witnesses of genocide and its effects. So it is very appropriate that she introduce to you Raphael Lemkin and to offer her interpretation of the essential concept of this course, the concept of genocide. Professor. Before I begin, I have to thank Andrew, who has done a remarkable job. who has done a remarkable job um, making sure that this is almost error-free. So I absolve him of any errors after this, and all the rest are mine. The topic for today's discussion is the concept of genocide. And I do want to emphasize that I am a sociologist by training but I am also a political sociologist. So I try to approach uh, understanding genocide from a kind of mixed position. And I think the sociology students in here will um, catch a hint of that uh, as I move along. So what is genocide? Well, the sociologist, Leo Cooper, has stated, the word is new, the concept is ancient. Important questions arise as we contemplate the concept of genocide. Primarily among them are, what are the origins of the term of genocide, the term genocide, and why was it essential to frame it as a legal concept, and how has our understanding of genocide evolved? The term genocide did not exist before 1944, but history before then is filled with brutal and organized mass murders. In the shadow of the mass murders in Armenia and the Holocaust, it became clear to the world community that there was no specific legal definition that could codify a law against the systematic destruction of a particular group by that we mean there wasn't any language in the law that you could use to, for lack of a better word, arrest someone for the crime. Genocide, then, was meant as a very specific term referring to violent crimes committed against groups with the intent to destroy the very existence of the group. So, the outline for today's lecture is I'm going to give you an introduction and then a historical overview of genocide. I'm going to speak about the influence of a great man by the name of Raphael Lemkin. And I hope to help you understand the genocidal process. And I'm going to end with uh, the question, what can be done? And a plea for you to think uh, about perhaps what you might be able to do. Social scientists and historians have written about a wide-ranging selection of historical events that entail widespread murder. They range from the destruction 
of Milos by Athens during the Peloponnesian War. Anybody know? Does that ring a bell, the Peloponnesian Wars? You remember them well. Um, the Roman siege and eventual raise, raising of Carthage at the close of the Third Punic War. And Christians in Europe's medieval era, approximately the 9th to the 14th century. They conducted onslaughts such as, if you've heard this, the Crusades, or religiously sanctified campaigns against unbelievers, whether in France, um, against the Cathar heretics who insisted on having their own uh, liturgy uh, away from the Catholic Church, or in Germany against the Jews, this is in the Middle Ages, or the Holy Land of the Middle East. In the 13th century, a million or so Mongol hordesmen under their leader Genghis Khan surged out of the grasslands of East Asia to lay waste to vast territories. They extended to the gates of Western Europe. Entire nations were exterminated, leaving behind nothing but rubble, fallow fields, and bones. In addition to religious and cultural beliefs, a hunger for wealth, power, and death-defying glory seems to have motivated these acts of mass violence. These factors combined to fuel the genocide of the early modern era, dating from about 1492, the year of the Caribbean Indians' fateful encounter with Christopher Columbus. It should be noted that what I'm going to show you is not a comprehensive um, set of examples, but ones done um, that I found good slides for, or, or that are probably recognizable by some of you. OK. But you didn't know about this one. How many people knew about this? Good. Very good. Professor Dodgen, talk about that? Just on research. What major? History major. <laughs> Early missionaries to Japan learned Japanese, and all they, although they were admired for their knowledge of the outside world, their proselytizing was entirely unwelcome. They persisted in their missionary zeal and made large inroads among the population. The violence against the Jesuit missionaries eventually extended to all Christians, Europeans, or even Japanese converts to Christianity. This persecution eventually led to the imposition of the exclusion orders, which kept Europeans out of Japan until the 19th century. Lest we think genocide is a foreign phenomenon, we need to remember that over 150,000 Native Americans lived sustainably in California prior to the gold rush. They had existed for many centuries supporting themselves by hunting, gathering, and fishing. This life changed dramatically in 1848 when James Marshall discovered that yellow metal in the American River at Colma in Northern California. In 1870, there was an estimated population of only 31,000 California Indians left from 150,000 to 31,000. Over 60% of the indigenous people died from disease introduced by hundreds of thousands of the so-called 49ers. However, local tribes were also systematically chased off their lands, marched to missions and reservations, enslaved and brutally massacred. 
1851, the California state government paid $1 million for scalping missions. $1 million, 1851, scalping missions. You could still get $5 for a severed Indian head in Shasta in 1855, and 25 cents for a scalp. 25 cents for a scalp in Honey Lake in 1863. Over 4,000 Native American children were sold. Prices ranged from $60 for a boy to $200 for a girl. Early definitions of widespread murder included barbarianism and mass death. In the 19th and early 20th century, there were attempts um, included in international treaties aimed at preventing war and crimes against humanity. Examples of those are the Geneva Conventions and various Hague Treaties, which forbid the murder of POWs, non-combatants, or acts such as sinking passenger ships. But there still was no language that provided for a law against creating mass death. By the early 20th century, events proved that treaties were not effective in deferring mass murder, deterring mass murder. Now we come to the influence of Raphael Lemkin. Born in 1901, he grew up in a Jewish family in a town in eastern Poland. Lemkin developed a talent for languages. He would under, end up mastering at least a dozen or more, and a passionate curiosity about the cultures that produced them. He was struck by accounts of the suffering of Christians at Roman hands and its parallel in the pogroms then affecting the Jews in eastern Poland. His early experiences made Lemkin acutely sensitive to the concerns and anxieties about self-preservation. Those events prompted Lemkin's lifelong study of mass killing in history and the contemporary world. As a boy, who was homeschooled by his well-educated ed linguist mother, he noted that he raced, quote, raced through an unusually grim reading list that familiarized him with cases from antiquity and the medieval era, including Carthage, and the fate of the Aztec and Inca empires. He was quoted as saying, I was appalled by the frequency of the evil and above all, by the impunity coldly relied on by the guilty. Why was the question that began to consume him? A key moment for him came, interestingly enough, in 1921, while he was studying at the University of Lvov. Soghamon Tellurian, an Armenian survivor of the genocide or of the Turkish campaign against his people, was arrested for the murder of Talat Pasha. And if you've done your reading, that should at least ring a bell. Uh, Pasha, Talat Pasha was one of um, the Armenian genocide's architects after he. Um, architects and Sologman gunned him down in a street in Berlin. In the same year, leading planners and perpetrators of the Armenian genocide were freed by the British from custody in uh, Malta as part of the Allies' post World War I uh, courting of a resurgent Turkey. Lemkin wrote that he was shocked by the juxtaposition, quote, a nation was killed and the guilty persons were set free. Why is a man punished when he kills another man? Why is the killing of a million 
a lesser crime than the killing of a single individual. Despite the post-World War I prosecutions of the Turks for crimes against humanity, governments and public opinion leaders were still wedded to the notion that state sovereignty trumped atrocities against the state's own citizens. The state had control over what happened to its citizens. It was this legal impunity that rankled and galvanized Lemkin more than anything else. Until the Second World War, genocide was a crime without a name, in the words of British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. The man who named the crime placed it in a global historical context and demanded intervention and remedial action was a refugee from Nazi-occupied Europe himself. His story is one of the most remarkable of the 20th century. On December 9, 1948, in the shadow of the Holocaust, and in no small part due to the tire, tireless efforts of Lemkin himself, the United Nations approved a convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. This convention established genocide as an act, as an international crime, which signatory nations undertook to prevent and punish. So if a nation signed the, gen, the, the convention, they promised that they were going to pursue people who committed genocide. Now, Lemkin derived the term genocide from the Greek word geno, which, genos, which means birth race of a similar kind, and from the Latin sida, which means to cut or to kill. The, I will um, read you the United Nations definition. The train's leaving. <laughs> Not until it gets to the station. <laughs> so I'm first. I'm going to give you a very simplified or cogent definition of genocide, which was created by two sociologists. And that is that genocide is a form of one-sided mass killing in which a state or other authority intends to destroy a group as that group and membership in it are defined by the perpetrators. It's kind of precise and cogent. However, the United States, the United Nations definition is uh, much more thorough. And I didn't want to put it up there because you would be writing, 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 writing. Students, it's in Jones um, for other people who are not in the class and not reading our texts, United Nations definition genocide, and Google will give it to you, but I'm going to read it to you. Genocide means any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. There are, this definition is very problematical. Um, although it covers what 
governments and politicians and people wanted to institute after the Holocaust. Um, it does not um, address all of the possible uh, instances of genocide. And as I say, it's, it's become problematical. Um, now I, I want to talk about, uh, we know now what the definition is, and I'll go back, no, don't go back that far. A form of one-sided mass killing in which a state or other authority intends to destroy a group as that group and membership in it are defined by the perpetrator. You can see how this is very specific to both the Armenian genocide and the Holocaust. Destroy a group as that group and membership in it are defined by the perpetrator. That's the other thing. Um, the perpetrators generally have complete say over who is who. So I want to talk about the major causes of genocide, and I'll go into more detail of them. The major causes of genocide, or the systematic destruction of an entire people, are political ideology, and I'll talk a bit more about that, the use of propaganda and mass media, philosophical rationales, But legalized discrimination and segregation, laws are passed. Ignorance, stereotypes, racial prejudice, propaganda, and the use of philosophical rationales are major components of the precursors and actions of people who commit genocide or, or regimes. State-sponsored violence, willing participants, Non-participant bystanders, people who stand back and don't do anything. The cover of war. It has been said that most genocides occur while a war is going on. Appeasement policy, people who turn their head the other way. Ignorance, stereotypes, racial prejudice. I want to talk about the first um, element that I, I believe is so important in understanding uh, genocide, and that is ideology. Ideology is a belief or myth system. You can believe it, but it also could be a myth, an entirely made up. In the case of genocide, it is used to justify and legitimize discriminatory acts against victims. Examples you know well from last week are anti-Semitism, but others are racism, um, or even a common um, preoccupation with, a, with a, um, an idealized past. Do you remember when we saw, or I, I guess we didn't see it, but in the video, my students saw uh, Master Ice, 1933, and it showed the Nazis in medieval garb traveling through the forest as this Aryan, great Aryan people digging up fake artifacts from the past. And the Nazis used this notion of a special idealized Aryan past to separate Aryans from Jews. And these are all used to justify the social disintegration of the victims. All genocides are different. However, ideologies commonly preoccupy perpetrators of genocide, racial and ethno 
uh, religious hatred, longing for an idealized past, and believe, belief in the right to territorial expansion. These ideologies serve to both foment and justify genocidal atrocities. When we see these ideologies being touted, we should keep in mind that genocide is sometimes waiting in the shadows. Perpetrators use ideologies to render their victims isolated, powerless, and outside the customary universe of moral obligation. And I'll talk more about that. This is a very important concept that comes from a scholar, a sociologist, who studied genocide, Helen Fine. And she says that the universe of moral obligation is that circle of persons toward whom obligations are owed, to whom the rules apply, and whose injuries call for attention and healing. Just as a mental mind reliever at this point, you might think about who is in your universe of mutual obligation. Who are you obliged to apply the rules to, and who and what injuries do you feel as though um, call for your attention and healing? How far out does it go? Just your friends? Just your neighborhood? Just your city? Just your religious group? It's an important question to think about because very often we don't include people who are suffering outside that circle. The fewer the shared values and standards in a society, the more likely members of the outgroup or that group that are being pushed out of the universe or out of that circle find themselves and they are beyond the universe of obligation. Okay, I, I'm, don't, don't write them down. I'm going to tell you most of them but very quickly. But um, as we can see from this list, the 20th century earned the title of the century of genocide. Um, I want to briefly introduce you to the century. Um, we have encountered some of these events in our course of study so far, but in order to understand the wide reach of genocide, we should attempt to explore the pervasive nature of the attempt to destroy entire populations. So I'm going to go through hmm, all of them. Wow, that's why I was up late. The first um, genocide was the Herero genocide in Namibia in 1904 and 1905. The death toll was 60,000, small by Armenian and Holocaust standards, but it was three quarters of the population. And the population were removed or destroyed by military operations uh, by the colonists in South Africa. We've heard about the Armenian Genocide. It has been our goal to have you know how important it is for us to study the Armenian Genocide because of its connection to the philosophy of this course. Ambassador Henry Morgenthau Sr. cabled Washington and clearly described the Turkish campaign. Persecution of Armenians is assuming unprecedented proportions. Reports from widely scattered districts indicate that there is a systematic attempt to uproot peaceful Armenian, the peaceful Armenian population. 
arbitrary arrests, terrible tortures, wholesale expulsions, and deportations from one end of the empire to the other, accompanied by frequent instances of rape, pillage, and murder, are turning, uh, murder turning into massacre, are bringing destruction and destitution on them. He continued, these measures are not in response to popular or fanatical demands, but are purely arbitrary and directed from Constantinople in the name of military necessity, often in districts where no military operations are likely to take place. There, seem to be, there seems to be a systematic plan to crush the Armenian race, and he uses race the way they used it then. The Armenians are not a race. Um, we have heard about um, how Armenians were driven into the desert, about the children that died. This is the framework that influenced Lemkin. He knew that this was all happening. He was, in essence, living in the aftermath of this mass murder. The premeditated destruction of the Armenian people was an attempt to not only destroy humans, but the, but the Turks also attempted to erase the centuries-old Armenian culture. They destroyed major objects of Armenian cultural, religious, historical, and communal heritage. That was a key purpose of both the genocide itself and the post-genocidal campaign of denial. We may have something like that happening now. The Ukrainian f uh, famine of 1932 and 33. Um, I just kind of briefly knew about this, and until I started teaching the course, um, started learning about what went on in the Ukraine, of all places. Uh, there are other things going on in the Ukraine now. Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, set in motion events designed to cause a famine in the Ukraine to destroy the people there seeking independence from his rule. As a result, an estimated 7 million persons perished in this farming area known as the breadbasket of Europe, depriving the people of food they had grown with their own hands. You know, it's uh, always a temptation, you know, go looking for slides that portray what goes on. And the things that I saw, I decided to spare you. So you have a, an artist's rendition of what went on, but it was just absolutely horrific. Seven million people. The Nanking Massacre, 1937-1938, was also known as the Rape of Nanking, and it was an episode of mass murder and mass rape committed by Japanese troops against the residents of Nanking, China during the Second Sino-Japanese War. The six weeks of carnage would become known as the Rape of Nanking and represented the single worst atrocity during the World War II era in either the European or the Pacific theaters of war. Those are our two bricks that are at the Holocaust and Genocide Memorial, and our, there is a stone monument dedicated to the victims of the Nanking Massacre. Sonoma State has some interesting connections to both the Armenian, the Holocaust, and the Nanking Massacre. Um, not so much the Armenian, but both the Holocaust and the Nanking Massacre were experiences that faculty members went through. Um, 
emeritus professor John Steiner, who was um, in the death camp and at Auschwitz labor camps and on death marches, uh, later became a professor of sociology and the founder of this series and the center. And Professor Jean Chan, who is a professor of emeritus, I believe now, of Chinese. I mean, uh, excuse me, math, who um, was her group spurheaded having this part of the monument um, at the genocide monument. Um, and there is a memorial to the victims of Japanese brutality and a brick remembering Iris Chang, who was uh, the historian who wrote the first book that shined light um, in this tragedy um, and suffered great emotional problems because of what she discovered. Um, I'll come to the when I come to the stages of genocide, when I come to the last stage, I'll revisit Nanking. And of course, there was the Holocaust. And I chose to use a photograph of Lillian as well. How many of you are aware of the Cambodian genocide? Very good. In depth? Oh, good. I'll just bore you. In Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge's interpretation of Maoist communist ideology allowed them to believe that they could create a classless society simply by eliminating all social classes except for the old people. Poor peasants who work land. The Khmer Rouge believed that Cambodia should be returned to an alleged golden age, a remembered past, when the land was cultivated by peasants and the country would be ruled for and by the poorest in society. They wanted all members of the society to be rural agricultural workers rather than educated city dwellers who the Khmer Rouge believed had been corrupted by Western capitalist ideas. In order to be loyal to the state, the Khmer Rouge enforced the breaking of ties to religion and family. All political and civil rights were abolished. Formal education ceased. And from January 1977, all children from the age of eight were separated from their parents and placed in labor camps, an act that falls under the UN Declaration. They taught, were taught that the state was their true parent. For the Khmer Rouge, children were central to the revolution as they believed they could easily be molded, conditioned, and indoctrinated. They could be taught to obey orders, become soldiers, and kill enemies. Children were taught to believe that anyone not conforming to the Khmer laws were corrupt enemies. Khmer Rouge ideology stated that the only acceptable lifestyle was that of poor agricultural workers. Factories, hospitals, schools, and universities were shut down. Lawyers, doctors, teachers, engineers, and qualified professionals in all fields were thought to be a threat to the new regime. And the simple act of wearing glasses was enough to make you an enemy of the state because if you wore glasses, that meant you wanted to read. And if you wanted to read, that meant you were educated. And if you were educated, you were an enemy of the state. East Timor. The Indonesian invasion of East Timor in December 1975 set the stage for the long, bloody, disastrous occupation 
of the territory that ended only after international peacekeeping, uh, international peacekeeping force was introduced in 1999. The Mayan genocide of 1981 to 1983. In the words of a 1999 UN-sponsored report on the civil war in Guatemala, quote, the Army's perception of Mayan communities as natural allies of the anti-government guerrillas contributed to increasingly and aggravating, aggravating, increasing and aggravating the human rights violations perpetrated against them demonstrating an aggressive racist component of extreme cruelty that led to extermination en masse of defenseless Mayan communities, including children, women, and the elderly, through methods whose cruelty has outraged the moral conscience of the civilized world. That's from the UN. For those of you who remember, the United States was involved because it was providing weapons so that this could happen. Um, our hands are not clean, but they're not clean from afar in history and afar from distance. The Iraqi Anfal campaign, led by Saddam Hussein against the Kurds, was a systematic and deliberate murder of at least 50,000 and possibly as many as 100,000 Kurds because they were Kurds. It was the culmination of a long-term strategy to solve what the government saw as its Kurdish problem. One chapter in this campaign in 1988, um, in one chapter, chemical weapons were used uh, against Kurdish vi villages. Um, and um, I think there was some implication that Saddam Hussein received that poisonous gas from the US government. The Kurds have been named a people without a country. Um, fierce fighters, and to this day, they're being um, shifted between Iraq and Syria and now threatened. You can see how close they are to the places where ISIS is making its inroads. Bosnia was part of the Ottoman Empire until 1878, and then uh, part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire until the First World War. After World War I, it was united with other Slav territories to form Yugoslavia, essentially ruled and run by Serbs from the Serbian capital in Belgrade. Yugoslavia disintegrated in June of 1991. And in 1992, in the Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina, conflict between the three main ethnic groups, the Serbs, the Croats, and the Muslims, resulted in genocide committed by the Serbs against Muslims in Bosnia. Rwanda in 1994, um, 800,000 Tutsis were mur murdered in a three-month period, and the international community watched the event unfold and did nothing. We'll learn more about Rwanda as we move along. 
imagine that, 800,000 people in a three-month period. And that was largely without machine guns. So. In this slide, Darfurian relatives mourn the body, over the body of a one-year-old child who died of malnutrition. In June 2004, in a refugee camp near a town in the Darfur region of Sudan. This is an ongoing genocide. Um, I will have more to say about this towards the end. The how many people remember Save Darfur? Okay, so um, there are other places where there's genocide going on. Um, the Congo, ongoing, um, has to do with diamonds and minerals and everything that goes into your cell phone and um, to the point where there are um, movements abroad or afoot to just buy cell phones that are made from conflict-free minerals and people are getting engaged and buying conflict-free diamonds. Um, it's about the most we can do in the West, but I would suggest later on that that's not entirely the case. Um, Dr. Gregory Stanton has given us a wonderful um, framework for understanding genocide. Um, and he's broken it down and told us about the eight stages of genocide. And you can see that the cartoon says genocide, genocide, well, difficult question. And there are the diplomats standing in a field of bodies. Genocide is a process that develops in eight stages, according to Stanton, that are predictable but not inevitable. At each stage, preventative measures can stop it. The process is not linear. Logically, later stages must be preceded by earlier stages, but all stages continue to operate throughout the process. The first stage is classification. All cultures have categories to distinguish people into us and them. We do it every day. Giants and the Dodgers. Um, Northern Californians and Southern Californians to be. And we do this by ethnicity, by race, by religion. We do it by nationality. German and Jew, Hutu and Tutsi, societies that lack mixed categories um, are most likely to have genocide occur. The main preventative measure at this early stage is to develop universalistic institutions that transcend ethnic or racial divisions. Um, I would suggest to you that they are attempting to do that in Rwanda. They no longer speak in Rwanda about Hutu and Tutsi. In Rwanda, we are Rwandans, they say. And this is a conscious effort on the part of the government to move past those old ethnic divisions and divides. Another important step at this point is to actively promote tolerance and understanding and to promote classifications that tr transcend these divisions. 
with the physical classifications that took part not only in Nazi Germany, but also in Rwanda and other places. The Belgians were very famous for um, categorizing uh, Hutu and Tutsi by supposed physical attributes. The Catholic Church could have played this role in Rwanda, saying we are all Catholics or we're all Christians. Um, but unfortunately, they were subject to the same divisions. And um, there have been a few Catholic priests who have been convicted of genocide because of their lack of assistance and also uh, of their active involvement in the genocide in um, Rwanda. So the Belgians distinguish between Hutus and Tutsis by nose size, height, and eye type. Belgians believe that the Tutsis were naturally superior, a naturally superior nobility, descended from the Israelite tribe of Ham, and that the Tutu, um, Hutus were descended from the Bantus, or a primitive uh, African ethnicity, I, I imagine. So we see that there were charts that helped bureaucrats understand how you see one person as one thing or as another. Um, gypsies or the Roma and the Sinti. Gypsy is a derogatory term and I apologize for using it. I guess in the middle they're looking at chins or noses or kind of nonsense but they really believed it, yes. So you, what you've said is that you have learned or you believe you've learned? It seems as though that the best um, preventative of that is nationalism and to promote the nation and we're all part of the nation. What happens to your neighbor? Neighboring country. Nationalism was, was a very important factor in lots of horrible things that happened in the pre on another topic. Okay, the Germans were famous for this. This is a chart that shows and instructs who is an Aryan and who isn't an Aryan. And you can see that in the second column over, um, Mischling, mixed race person. Mischling of the second degree. There are the Jews over there in the fourth column. And this is all nonsense. Um, created some some very strange situations. Um, that there were people who were raised in Germany as no religion, but because they had the wrong number of Jewish grandparents, the Nazis said, you're a Jew. The next step is symbolization. 
We give names or other symbols to the classifications. We name people Jews or gypsies or distinguish them by colors or dress. Apply the symbols to members of the group. Classification and symbolization are universally human and do not necessarily result in genocide unless they lead to the next stage, which I will talk about, which is dehumanization. When combined with hatred, symbols may be forced upon unwilling members of outsider groups. The yellow star for Jews under Nazi rule. The blue scarf for people from the Eastern zone in Khmer Rouge. Rouge, Khmer Rouge, red Khmer. People in the East were called blue. To combat symbolization, hate symbols can be legally forbidden, such as swastikas, um, as can hate speech. Group marking like gang clothing or tribal scarring can be outlawed as well. The problem is that legal limitations um, will fail if they're unsupported by popular cultural enforcement. And though the Hutus and the Tutsis were forbidden words in Burundi, until the 1980s, code words replaced them. If widely supported, however, denial of symbolization can be powerful, as it was in Bulgaria and in Denmark, where the Jewish star was never instituted. The next stage is dehumanization. This is where one group denies the humanity of the other, or others. Classification and symbolization become stages of genocide only when combined with dehumanization. Denial of the humanity of others is the step that permits killing with impunity. impunity. The universal human abhorrence of murder of members of one's own group is overcome by treating the victims as less than. Less than me, less than us, less than human. In incitements to genocide, the target groups are called disgusting animal names. Nazi propaganda called Jews rats or vermin. Rwandan um, Hutu hate radio referred to the Tutsis as cockroaches. The targeted group is often likened to a disease or microbes or infections or a cancer in the body politic. It wants to stay there, Andrew. Oh, there we go. Bodies of genocide victims are often mutilated to express this denial of humanity. Such atrocities then become the justification for revenge killings because they are evidence that the killers must be monsters, not human beings themselves. So it foments this. anger back and forth. The next stage is organization. And Stanton says that genocide is always collective because it derives its impetus from group identification. It's always organized, often by states, but also by militias and hate groups. Planning need not be elaborate. Hindu mobs may hunt down Sikhs or Muslims, led by local leaders. Methods of killing need not be complex. Tutsis in Rwanda died from machetes. 
Muslim chums in Cambodia from hoe blades to the back of the neck. Bullets must not be wasted was the rule at Cambodian extermination prisons, expressing the dehumanization of the victims. Social organization of genocide varies by culture. It reaches its most mechanized bureaucratic form in the Nazi death culture. But it is always organized, whether by the Nazi SS or the Rwandan Interhamwe. Death squads may be trained for mass murder, as in Rwanda, and then they force everyone to participate, which happened there, spreading hysteria and overcoming individual resistance. Terrorist groups will pose one of the greatest threats to genocidal mass murder, especially if they gain access to chemical, biological, and even nuclear weapons. These are the Janjaweed, the militia, the devils on horseback in Darfur. The next step is polarization. Extremists drive the groups apart. Hate groups broadcast and print polarizing propaganda. Laws are passed that forbid intermarriage or social interaction. Political moderates are silenced, threatened, and intimidated, and then killed. Polarization proceeds in a downward cycle of killings until like a whirlpool, it reaches the vortex of mass murder. Killings by one group may provoke revenge killings from the other. Such massacres are aimed at polarization, the systematic elimination of moderates who would show, uh, slow the cycle. The first to be killed in a genocide are the moderates. First victims of the Nazis were the Social Democrats and the Communists and the Socialists. People who would ex oppose the extremists. The center cannot hold the most extreme takeover polarizing the conflict and negotiated settlement has, becomes impossible. Jews are not wanted here from a child's book, picture book. Table of Anti-Jewish Legislation in Germany, 1933 to 1943. Can't sit on park benches, can't walk in the park. Um, and this is part of preparation. That had an extremely high Circulation, Der Sturmer, some violently anti-Semitic newspaper in Germany. So we come to preparation. Preparation for genocide includes the identification, lists are made, they're drawn up, houses are marked, Maps are made, individuals are forced to carry ID cards identifying their ethnic or religious group. That was true in Germany and it was also true in Rwanda. You had to have a pass and it said whether you were Hutu or Tutsi. Identification greatly speeds the slaughter. 
In Germany, identification of Jews was defined by law and was performed by a methodical bureaucracy in Rwanda. Uh, bureaucracy. In Rwanda, identity cards showed each peasant's ethnicity. In the genocide, Tutsis could then easily be pulled from cars or roadblocks and murdered. Throwing away the cards did not help because anyone who did not prove that they were a Hutu was presumed to be a Tutsi. Preparation also includes the expropriation of property of the victims. It may include concentration, herding of the victims into ghettos, stadiums, or churches. In its most extreme form, it even includes the construction of concentration and extermination camps or conversion of existing buildings, temples, and schools into extermination centers, which was done in Cambodia. Transportation of the victims to these killing centers is then organized and bureaucratized. bureaucratized. even in the camps. Um, obviously, Jews had their um, markings. This, this is a, a poster you can get at the museum in Washington, but tells all the different, you know, antisocial, criminal, um, socialist. And on their uniforms, they would have these patches. The final phase is extermination. This is the seventh step. It is considered extermination rather than murder because the victims are not considered human. They are vermin, they are rats, they are cockroaches. Killing is described by euphemisms of purification, ethnic cleansing. In Bosnia, uh, rat extermination. In a, um, or ethnic cleansing, excuse me, in Bosnia, and rat extermination in Algeria. Targeted members of alien groups are killed, often including children. Because they are not considered persons, their bodies are mutilated, buried in mass graves, or burnt like garbage. The last step in genocide is denial. Every genocide is followed by denial. Mass graves are dug up and hidden. The historical records are burned or closed to historians. Even during the genocide, those committing the crimes dismiss reports as propaganda. Afterwards, such deniers are called revisionists. Others deny uh, through more subtle means by characterizing reports as unconfirmed or alleged because they do not come from officially approved sources. By minimizing the number killed, by quarreling about whether the killing um, fits the legal definition of genocide by claiming that the deaths of the perpetrating group exceeded that of the victim group. Well, more of us died than you. Or that the deaths were the result of civil war, not genocide. In fact, civil war and genocide are not mutually exclusive. Most genocides occur during wars. Um, that is the impetus. This denial is what moves great numbers of Armenians to want people to learn about what happened to them because the Turkish government, as you all know, continues to deny that there was a genocide. It was a war, you know. I want to re recommend this book 
to you. I know students have more than enough to read, uh, but I also know that there are many people who um, come to the lectures. Um, it is eminently written, um, exceptionally powerful. She traces the whole history of America's place in the age of genocide. Um, I'm sure that there are lots of used copies floating around. It won the Pulitzer Prize. Samantha Power is now our ambassador to the United Nations. Um, she eloquently reminds us that intolerance and indifference are a most lethal pair of foes. And she analyzes in this book what America has done and what America has not done during the century of genocide, and it also bleeds into the 21st century. It's imperative that we attend to the current situation in Darfur and the Sudan. It is a region, if not on the edge of genocide, firmly inside its boundaries. In one of the worst campaigns of mass slaughter since World War II, more than 2.1 million, million civilians have been killed in the Sudan over decades of brutal conflict between North and South, in Darfur in the West, and in other regions. Since the 1950s, the Arab-dominated government of Sudan, centered in the capital of Khartoum, has tried to impose its control on the country's African minorities living along the nation's periphery. The result has been a deadly mix of ethnic, religious, and politically motivated conflicts. Though the North-South Civil War is over, and South Sudan gained its, uh, centered in Khartoum, has tried to impose its control on the country's African minorities living along the nation's periphery. That they've attempted to do that. The result has been a deadly mix of ethnic, religious, and politically motivated conflict. I said that. Skipped a paragraph. Citizens in Darfur and the border areas between the two countries remain at risk, and violence in South Sudan threatens to destabilize the newly independent country. I've already mentioned the Janjaweed who were in Darfur, and now they have moved into the Nubo Mountains as well. Devils on horseback. So the call has been never again. The Nuba Mountains, referred to as the Nuba Hills, are an area located in Sudan, that yellow spot. The area is home to a group of indigenous ethnic groups known collectively as the Nuba people. The international community, including a number of celebrities, such as George Clooney. Did you know that George Clooney is interested in this? If he is interested, why? Well, we all should. They've traveled to the Nuba Mountains and documented the, documented the continued genocidal activities of the government of um, Colonel Bash, President Bashir. Um, there's a man who writes about genocide. Uh, he's written more books than I can count on the fingers of my hands about genocide. His name is Samuel Totten. And over the holidays, he, with some volunteers, went to Sudan at great peril to themselves and funded by the community of genocide scholars in the United States, took food supplies to the people in the Numba Mountains. It should be noted that President Bashir 
was indicted as a war criminal. He can't leave the Sudan, because if he does, he'll be grabbed. <coughs> Excuse me. As a result of his genocidal activities in Darfur. So, for over two years, a humanitarian catastrophe has unfolded in the Nuba Mountains as fighting intensifies between the government of Sudan and the thousands of fighters from the Sudan's People Liberation Movement. Hundreds of thousands of civilians have been forced to flee their homes, just as they did in Darfur, as the Sudanese government bombs civilian targets, destroys communities in scorched earth ground attacks, and blocks humanitarian agencies from reaching people in need of assistance. Since June of 2011, the government of Sudan has embarked on a campaign of aerial bombings, forced denial of humanitarian aid. The catastrophe that has unfolded for over three years in this area of Sudan, uh, which re resides in the south Kordofan state, just north of the Sudan, <clears throat> and at the South Sudan border, has severely impacted hundreds of thousands of people. I can't believe the world stood by and did nothing. I can't either. When do you think the movie Hotel Sudan will be released? We come back to the universe of moral obligation, and each of us has to ask um, just who is in that circle. Um, I can't go tromping off to Sudan, um, and I do what small work I can by supporting various organizations that are attempting to make life easier for the people in Sudan. And I would suggest that um, if all of us decided that at one point maybe there is a little bit of money we can part with, but there's also something you can do. Recognize that? Those are people from Santa Rosa. And that is the walk to end genocide. I don't know what year it was. But all those people, including a, a team from Sonoma State, showed up to walk against genocide, or to end genocide, and um, take part in those activities. They're going to do it again this April on the 26th. Um, I would suggest that if you're interested, that you go to, did I get that? No, I didn't get it. Um, JWW, Jewish World Watch. It's an organization that uh, provides assistance in Africa and other places in the world where people's lives uh, are threatened. And so I come to the end of a long list of atrocities that have happened uh, with just this simple statement that I was tired of reading about what had happened and decided that even in the smallest of ways, I could make a difference. And I hope you'll seriously consider that. Thank you. Questions? Students first. Do I have a student? One, I have a student. I have a man in the balcony, he's a student. Yes? I'll repeat the question.
1948. When, when was the United Nations Convention Against Genocide passed? And that was 19, I think they came up with it. I'm not sure whether it passed in 1948. There were some problems. Um, uh, members of the Security Council at that time, or um, you remember about the Ukrainian famine, the Soviet Union? Well, from a distance in history, we can say it was a genocide, but they were kind of sensitive about having the convention so explicit. And remember the California Indian? The United States was very sensitive about what happened to the Native Americans. And both of those historical facts impinge on some of the efforts, international efforts, to um, criminalize some of these activities. OK, students are done. Yes? Twenty million plus under. Do I consider the death of twenty million plus under Stalin a genocide? Um, over and above the Ukrainian famine. All the people that were essentially killed as part of that. Well, I think I need more information about that. I know there were people who died in the gulags and um, were sent to Siberia, but w where does that number come from? I, I guess I read it or heard it quoted. Hmm? The Stalinist purges. The Stalinist purges. Um, at some point, um, you can say that an anything that has large numbers becomes genocide, and the term loses its effect. And in fact, there are people now who are talking about things like politicide. So that might fall into something that was a political mess. We're talking about gender side, uh, places where women and young girls are maimed and murdered, fratricide, the Civil War. I mean, um, as it's moved along, some of it has actually kind of losing its punch or at least the punch it had after the Holocaust and the Armenian genocide. Why does it matter? OK. But why does it matter that the word genocide is losing its punch? Um, Isn't it just an evil, what kind you, of side it is? We can call anything evil, but unless we have the tools to make it a crime, there isn't much we can do about it. And that was why the, the term genocide was so important. Coming up with the word and the convention, which is essentially a law by which people can be charged. Yeah? Uh, in what ways do you believe the UN uh, definition of genocide needs to be expanded? Is there any do I believe that the UN definition needs to be expanded? Probably. Not completely, but probably there are some areas. Um, I am personally most interested in how women are treated throughout the world. Yes? Um, you mentioned Nanking. Nanking. Um, I don't compare genocides. I'm, I might have by using the word worst. Um, but it was the worst thing that happened in the Pacific theater. But I think we make a big mistake if we say, well, the Holocaust was worse than the Native Americans. There, there is no 
weighing the scales when it comes to that kind of thing. So if I did say it was the worst in that context, the whole context of, of World War II, I misspoke and I meant that it was in, in Asia. The, the one thing is that most people don't know about it. How many people knew about Nanking? Okay, your history majors and <laughs> your adults who have lived longer. Yes? According to the convention, intent. Yes, what distinguishes genocide from mass murder? And I would say that under most circumstances, it's intent. The intent to destroy all. You know, sometimes they're not quite uh, good at getting all the people, but that's built into what, you know, the Nazis were going to get all of the Jews. Yes. What do you think the best way to walk to end genocide accomplished? What do I think the walk to end genocide accomplished? Well, everybody who walks raises some money, and the people at this organization, Jewish World Watch, have several projects in um, Africa. They provide um, one of the things that's happening in the Nuba Mountains is. They can't go, they're in caves and they can't go out to get firewood. And one of the things that they do is they provide um, solar cookers for women so to cook. Is, so anything over and above just the money, I mean, if you just contributed money, is that the same thing? Or does this have some additional benefit? Well, I think it raises awareness, but I also think it, it builds a community of people who are interested in, in making a difference and changing things. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, there are, do, do you not think that they mean anything? I don't, I mean, I've been to events like this, and mm -hmm. I wonder, like, you know, does everyone then go home and, you know, forget about it? Well, I pointed out to my students, and you should have read, not everybody can be a brave, as brave as the young woman from Arizona who was captured, the American woman who was captured by the Syrians and may, be, may have been murdered and may not have been murdered. Her name was Kayla Mueller. We, we all can't do that. But for those who are willing to do it, there is a cadre of people who work for the Jewish World Watch who go to the Sudan and this gives them funds, but also the spirit to know that it's a worthwhile thing that they're doing. Yes? Do you have documentation of genocide that has been prevented? Does anybody know of a genocide that's been prevented? What? If, see, my learned colleague said if it's been prevented, it wasn't a genocide. So how do we know that genocide can be prevented? Well, how do we know that? Hmm. I guess like human beings, we just need to strive. We don't know. We can walk. One of the things that Samantha Power says in her book that seems now, just a few years after it was published, to be, wow, would that it so. She says that each one of us, maybe not the students, but each one of us, is complicit because we don't write to our representatives in Congress and say, do something about this. And we learned, you know, from the Armenian genocide that Americans, um, in great numbers, did things to at least make the situation better. They couldn't prevent the genocide, but they could make things better. Maybe that's the most we can hope for.
Yes. That would be wonderful if the world has become very, very fragmented. And in order for there to be a peacekeeping mission in Sudan, you need the security, members of the Security Council to vote. And one of the reasons that the um, actions in Sudan are going on is because they have a lot of oil, <laughs> a lot of oil. And um, there are a lot of Chinese, I don't know a lot, but there are Chinese petrochemical companies that are, um, have interests there. So that immediately takes it to another place. It's not like uh, it can be done. Barbara? About 10 years ago, <clears throat> I learned that there was someone in um, Sacramento who was um, a member of the Rwandan community in exile who might come and speak to students about what was happening or what had happened in Rwanda. And uh, ambassador to the United States she had to give up her American passport, but she said she can get it back um, to become the uh, Rwandan ambassador to the United States, Mexico, and Brazil, isn't it? Yeah. But not at that time. She was just a teacher at a, a college in Sacramento. And she came and spoke to students and, and said, there are so many orphans that we have orphanages all over Rwanda. And what we're trying to do is um, teach them a trade. Uh, they don't have parents. They don't have grandparents. Um, and so we've set up workshops in the orphanages. And the students really responded to that. And every year, and I imagine we'll do it again this year, we pass the hat and ask for small contributions, nothing sizable, only what you can give, uh, so that students in the Rwandan orphanages can go to school for a year, have a uniform, buy their textbooks. And she goes back and takes that money to them, to the point where one of the larger orphanages actually has a Sonoma house. And so, you know, that's a direct link. And thank you for bringing that up, Barbara. And I hope you'll all be able to come and hear the ambassador who talking about it's really quite a miracle what's happening in Rwanda because they are Rwandans now. They're not Hutus and Tutsis. Um, and they're building a remarkable modern society where over 50% of the legislators are women. It's because, well, because a lot of the men aren't there anymore, but yes. I would say that evidence of a genocide that was prevented was in South Africa with Mandela. Because 
there wasn't all kinds of mass killing. And that was as a result of, I think, the leadership. And do you think that that could be true? Which leadership? I'm not backing anybody, but there were two sides to that. There had to be two sides. To, but I don't think it would have... The genocide had gone on earlier in the century in Namibia. But we don't know whether it would have been a genocide. It might have been a slow attrition. Yes. Did you have your hand up? Do I think that first world or third world com countries are more susceptible to genocide? Yeah, or it's like there's no distinction between them in terms of whether or not they genocide. I think there's so many complex factors that could shift either way that I, I, I'm not fully convinced myself that that is a primary factor. What do you think? Okay, well, it's, it's a good question. Yes? Um, do you see any signs of genocide um, percolating in Sudan currently? In the Sudan. Sudan. Yeah. Um, I think that there are some things that are happening there that are concerning. Chechnya. The Congo. Where? Right. No. Nope. Nigeria. Oh, Nigeria. Syria. You just speak Syria. ISIS. Some people might jump all over me, but Israel is pretty intense. It is intense, but I don't know whether it borders on genocide. Right. Good suggestion. I don't. I don't think so. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you. Thank you.